in our first story, Behind Mansion Walls. He came from a long line of highly respected and wealthy doctors. A millionaire medic caught up in a brutal kidnapping. She would have been trying to tear off the plastic bag from her head as she was running for her life. And later, favored by fortune, John had amassed a significant amount of money. Shadowed by a killer. I thought of him as an international stalker. I'm Christopher Mason. It's only human to envy the trappings of the rich and powerful. A 50-room mansion, the finest antique furniture, the fastest cars. But for some, jealousy can become an overwhelming obsession. They yearn to live behind mansion walls. And in order to get there, these green-eyed monsters will covet and kill. It's late afternoon. Cherokee County, Alabama, not far from the Georgia state line. Blowing off steam after work, two men stumble on a mystery, an abandoned car. Maybe it was dumped by car thieves. Then they make another discovery, one that will haunt them for the rest of their lives. They noticed the body floating in the water. A woman has been blasted several times with a shotgun. She was pretty much unrecognizable. In an exclusive gated community in Conyers, Georgia, Barbara Ann Roberts has finally found the recipe for happiness. The bubbly 49-year-old has bounced back from divorce, straight into the arms of multimillionaire Robert Sheese III. Oh, the two met online, and sparks flew. They corresponded back and forth there, and then they met and hit it off really well. The secret of her new beau's success isn't rocket science. It's brain surgery. Robert Sheese was a very successful neurosurgeon. He had a very successful practice in Atlanta. When he's not saving lives, Robert's writing papers, speaking at international conferences, reaping the rich rewards of a stellar career. He came from a long line of highly respected and wealthy doctors. From fine wine to fancy cars, the wealthy surgeon showers his lover with gifts. Oh, my. They were living a, a very lavish and generous lifestyle. He was in a position to pretty much buy anything that either of them wanted. On the other side of the tracks, near the Georgia state line, Barbara's ex-husband, Vernon, lives a more humble existence. Hey, baby. He's also found new love with work colleague, Darlene. After Vernon had divorced Barbara Roberts, he and Darlene started going out, uh, fell in love. It was romance all again, and uh, they were happily married. Darlene and Vernon work at a local factory to make ends meet. They're not rich. Their most valuable possession is each other. I think when they were at work together, they, they spent all the time together that, that they could. But in the spring of 2006, both couples' idyllic lives will be torn apart in an instant. The evening of April 6th, two locals discover a dead body lying face down in a pond. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, it was as gory as it could be. The plastic wadding from the shotgun shells were still lodged in her back, which would indicate that it was a very close, close shot. 
When the victim is identified, the quiet rural community of Rome, Georgia, is rocked to its core. We found out it was Darlene Roberts. It doesn't make sense. Darlene had no enemies. Hey, baby. Hey, darling. <sighs> so local sheriffs do what they always do in these cases. They zero in on the victim's husband. Vernon initially was a very obvious suspect. Vernon claims he last spoke to his wife before she went grocery shopping. When she didn't arrive home, he went looking for her. Vernon got into his vehicle, drove from his house, and drove to West Rome to try to find Darlene. So Vernon was out on the road around the time his wife was killed. Darlene's beloved gets the third degree. They were playing hardball with him. The husband's always the first. And so they gave him a tough interview. Investigators check out Vernon's alibi, and he is cleared. Cherokee County sheriffs are short on leads. The main people who were mentioned as possible other suspects were ruled out very quickly. They didn't have a lot of suspects right at first. But they do have one trump card. It's still only hours since Darlene was shot, so the killer could be lurking nearby. They set up roadblocks to try to stop people to ask if they had seen anything, if they had noticed anything. This is also a fresh crime scene. Investigators comb the area around the pond. They find no murder weapon, but they do unearth baffling clues. Plastic wrap cotton gauze, and a broken pair of glasses that don't belong to Darlene. Based upon what the evidence showed at the scene, it would be that she would have been trying to tear off the plastic bag from her head as she was running for her life. It looks like Darlene was tied up, but somehow broke free. This is all the hallmarks of a kidnapping. But why would anyone want to abduct Darlene Roberts? Detectives try to make the puzzle pieces fit. Then the roadblock reaps a reward. They had at least one person come forward and say that they had seen a black Dodge Dakota. Several witnesses claim to have seen the mysterious black pickup parked near the murder scene. When sheriffs are given a description of the driver, the investigation veers off on an unexpected path. One of the people that identified the Dodge Dakota identified the color of the hair, the looks of, of a man that fit the description of Robert Shees. What's an eminent neurosurgeon doing at the scene of a horrific murder? You'd imagine any millionaire brain surgeon worth his salt would be playing a round of golf or sipping martinis at his club. Strange then that Dr. Robert Sheese is spotted prowling the backwaters of sweet home Alabama, the very day a woman is brutally murdered. Dr. Sheese's delicate work relies on steely nerves and a steady hand. But in 2004, the esteemed surgeon loses his most valued tool after a serious car accident. A permanent hand tremor means he'll never operate again. I think it took away an enormous part of his life because it evidently meant a great deal to him to be able to help people. I think that it uh, took quite a lot away from him pretty much took away his reason for living. His millions can't stop him from sliding into a deep depression, using booze and prescription drugs to numb the pain. Those that were friends with Robert Sheese described him as, once he had that car wreck, that he was sort of a changed person. Could he have changed into a cold-blooded killer? At Dr. Sheese's upscale gated enclave in Conyers, Georgia, 
The wrought iron gates might keep out the riffraff, but they won't deter sheriffs armed with a search warrant. With Robert Sheese and Barbara Roberts out of town in Texas, Cherokee County investigators scour their swanky apartment. When they got to the apartment, they found the plastic which matched the plastic at the crime scene. The gauze, which some of which was still tied to Darlene's wrist. They also found the box that the shotgun had come in. There's no sign of the firearm. On a digital camera, they find a photo of Barbara, and it's no glamour shot. Her face is black and blue. The evidence is pointing to the millionaire medic being abusive as well as a murderer. There are still more questions than answers. Why would Robert Sheese want Darlene dead? And who owns the broken glasses found at the crime scene? Glasses have like a serial number. And so the police were able to trace that serial number to an optical shop in Conyers, Georgia. Opticians check their records and find the customer's name. Barbara Roberts. Barbara Roberts and Dr. Robert Sheese are now the two prime suspects. They're both still away in Texas, so police wait for their return. Then they pounce. Went onto the plane and snatched them off very unceremoniously. Carried one off in one direction and one in the other. Dr. Robert Sheese takes the fifth. He wasn't shocked. He wasn't surprised. There wasn't any objection. There wasn't any, uh, I didn't do anything. It was no admission whatsoever. But Barbara Roberts can't stop talking. She makes a stunning confession. She's been having a secret affair with her ex-husband, Vernon. Barbara had claimed that she and Vernon were still involved and that she had met him there at the house when Darlene would be gone and they'd have sex. She says when Robert Sheese found out about her cheating, he decided to take revenge on Vernon by raping Darlene. Barbara said originally that the plan had been to stop Darlene and the doctor was going to take advantage of her because he said that he knew that Barbara had had sex with Vernon and he was going to pay him back. She claims she went along with the sick plan because she was frightened of her unstable boyfriend. According to Barbara, the pair set a trap for Darlene, faking car trouble so she would stop to help. He had his hood raised on his vehicle and was waving like he needed help, and she stopped, which she normally would not have done. Down here. I, need a hand. I guess she thought somebody that close to her house wouldn't be a problem. I need a hand. They tried to put a uh, plastic bag over her head, this saran wrap, and tried to suffocate her. She got loose, took off running through this field toward this pond. Robert and Barbara jump in Darlene's car and follow her through the field. It's a terrifying chase. Darlene is hunted like an animal. Eventually, she is cornered at the pond. Barbara says Robert's next move was never part of the plan. She was, as she put it, freaking out. And the doctor whacked her in the face with the butt of the shotgun and broke her glasses.
Barbara says Robert shoots, then shoots Darlene Roberts three times. And leaves her body lying in the pond. With Barbara's detailed confession and Robert's stony silence, it seems Darlene Roberts' brutal murder has been solved. Or has it? This tragic tale will take one more unexpected twist. Barbara was obsessed with her ex-husband, Vernon. Did not want him to be with anyone else. grip of a jealous rage. One-time eminent neurosurgeon Robert Sheese kills Darlene Roberts in cold blood. <laughs> or so says his girlfriend, Barbara. She claims it was payback for her affair with Darlene's husband. She claimed that Bob found out about it and was very angry and wanted to pay Vernon back. It seems to be a straightforward case, until Vernon Roberts tells investigators there was no affair. He says Barbara wasn't sleeping with him. She was stalking him. She would call Vernon, and he would try to just leave her alone, ignore her. But apparently, after Barbara Roberts and Robert Sheese met, Barbara Roberts continued with her obsession of Vernon. According to Vernon's lawyer, Andy Davis, Barbara went beyond intimidation, launching a full-blown campaign of terror. One occasion, Barbara took a Molotov cocktail, placed it by Darlene's vehicle at a school that she was attending. Vernon also received two handwritten letters full of menace and decorated with scrawled tombstones. The notes threaten Vernon and Darlene. Investigators believe both are from the poison pen of Barbara Roberts. Was she the real mastermind behind this murder? The motive was that Barbara was obsessed with her ex-husband, Vernon, did not want him to be with anyone else. Robert Shees was hurt because he was in love with Barbara, and she wasn't giving him full attention. She was still obsessed with, with Vernon. In June 2008, more than two years after the shooting, Barbara Ann Roberts goes on trial for murder. Robert Shees still refuses to reveal what happened. He took the fifth and would not testify. So it's up to prosecutors to unravel the evil deeds that took place on the deserted road that afternoon. They believe Barbara convinced Robert Sheese to kidnap Darlene, to give her a scare. But this was no kidnapping. Barbara wanted to wipe out Vernon's new wife. A fellow inmate testifies that Barbara had confessed that she fired the fatal shots. The way she got the black eye was when she was firing the shotgun. The shotgun has a kick to it. That it kicked and it caused to black her eyes and break her glasses. Barbara Roberts had a rich, highly esteemed lover and a life of luxury. But it wasn't enough. She still burned with want. And Robert Sheese's millions couldn't buy the one thing she coveted, her ex-husband. After a week-long trial, the jury takes just two hours to find Barbara Ann Roberts guilty of first-degree murder. She was actually sentenced to death, but the judge commuted that to a life sentence. Her millionaire lover avoids a similar fate by striking a plea deal. And his plea agreement was for kidnapping with aggravated assault. 
he is sentenced to 20 years in jail for kidnapping, but is released after just three years. And in January 2011, after his release from prison, Dr. Robert Sheese, multimillionaire, former brain surgeon, and saver of lives, takes his own. This is a sad story. You had two couples who appeared to both be in love with each other, but one party in one couple was still obsessed with another. And so she ends up ruining the lives of more than just herself. She ends up ruining the lives of a number of people. I think all Darlene wanted was just to have a happy, calm, quiet life and enjoy her work and enjoy her time with her husband. It's such a waste of all those people's lives. Barbara Ann Roberts stumbled into riches and enjoyed the finest creature comforts, but still wasn't satisfied. Some spend their lives scrabbling for a foothold on the ladder of success, only to slip and fall. When wealth eludes these desperate wannabes, failure can be a bitter pill to swallow. When it comes to big money makers, it's hard to top the pharmaceutical industry. In the cutthroat biotech business, sales are measured in the tens of millions of dollars as the world clamors for the next miracle pill or powder. For pharmaceutical executive John Watson, the most exciting powder is found on Switzerland's exclusive ski slopes. British-born Watson has had a highly successful career working for some of the world's pharmaceutical giants. He had a deep knowledge of business and a deep background in biosciences. He understood the pharmaceutical business very well. Certainly well enough to have earned a sizable fortune. John uh, had amassed a significant amount of money. Well, the unmarried 65-year-old is also a fitness fanatic. John was a tall, good-looking guy, very fit, very healthy, an active cyclist, an active rollerblader. John mixes with other well-to-do friends on his European ski adventures, including international financial advisor Kent Keatwin. Kent Keatwin, at one point, had been hired by the Shah of Iran. He had lived over there and set up an accounting system for the Shah of Iran. Not a good time. Kent's also planning investment deals for his pal John. You're into the last. Now, come on, we did pretty well out of that. <laughs> he worked for a number of financial groups. He was a freelancer trying to sell his financial advice to people. Oh, thank you very much. That's well. It's a glittering life. And in 2008, John Watson leaves the biotech business behind. Retiring to exclusive La Jolla Shores, one of California's richest coastal enclaves. But even in retirement, John isn't resting on his laurels. He uses his time and money to help others. He got involved with a group called the Tech Coast Angels, a group of wealthy men in the San Diego region who invested in startup companies, many of them designed to help people with uh, lifelong and terminal diseases. His colleague and friend, Barry Kassar, says John's astute business sense could weed out imposters in the medical world. He was able to assess and analyze medical or biomedical startup companies quickly and thoroughly. He had no tolerance for people who came ill prepared to our meetings. And he could see through the balance sheet and the nonsense that people try to get away with very quickly. June 8th, 2010. John Watson is due to chair a Tech Coast Angels board meeting. When he doesn't show, Barry is worried. I looked around for John and he wasn't there. 
which surprised me a great deal, this was out of character for him, called his home, no reply. And for some reason, I got more and more anxious about the fact that he wasn't there. Barry drives to the millionaire's La Jolla Shores apartment. Inside, a shocking scene awaits. Oh my God, there's a body over there. John! John! We found John prostrate on the floor in his bedroom. Clearly, he had passed away sometime earlier. He's been dead at least a day. To police, it looks like natural causes. But Barry, a former doctor, is not convinced. His friend was too fit and healthy to just drop dead. And something else bothers him. It was surprising to us to see what a sorry state the apartment was in. Initially, I thought it might have been ransacked. Either John Watson lived like a complete slob, or there's more to this millionaire's death than meets the eye. The civilized setting of La Jolla Shores is not the sort of place where millionaires are murdered. Maybe that's why, when pharmaceutical big shot John Watson is found dead, police are quick to rule out foul play. In fact, the millionaire's body is already on its way to the crematorium when a dramatic phone call changes everything. I called the police and I asked what did the autopsy show. And to my absolute surprise, they had not done an autopsy and I strongly encouraged them to bring the body back to the medical examiner and to do a proper post-mortem examination. When the autopsy finally happens, it reveals there's nothing natural about the cause of this death. The hyoid bone in John's neck, which is right here, had been severed, which indicated to him strangulation. But that's not all they find. On the millionaire's back, almost invisible, two tiny puncture marks, like a snake bite. There were burn marks associated with these punctures. The coroner understood that these had come from a taser. John had been tasered before he'd been strangled. Is John the victim of a vicious break-in? When his friend Barry searches the apartment, that theory gains strength. We could not find his car keys and we could not find his laptop. The laptop's gone, but nothing else appears to be missing. Perhaps John's computer contained a startup company's medical secrets. Were they worth killing for? At first, they were really bewildered by the cause of this crime. John Watson had no enemies that anyone could speak of. Even though the apartment appears to be ransacked, there are no signs of a break-in. Was the killer someone John knew? What they were never able to figure out was how did somebody get in? Did John get a knock on the door and, op and open the door and, and he was surprised by his killer? Or was that person already inside the apartment waiting for him? Then, among scattered documents, Barry finds a copy of one of John Watson's bank statements. The account balance, $10 million. So I took it upon myself to call the broker in San Francisco, told him that John had passed away, and encouraged him to freeze the account. I'd like to talk to somebody about freezing funds in one of your accounts. Barry's too late. The money's gone. $10 million was transferred out of his account by way of cash and stocks to a new account at a new brokerage house in San Diego. How did John Watson make a withdrawal from beyond the grave? 
Detectives learn the day before his body was discovered, a man had walked into the brokerage house claiming to be John Watson. He had scratches on his face. He said, did you get my transfer request? I'm here to follow up on that. The transfer goes ahead, but shifting almost $9 million won't happen quickly. They spoke with him and they said, you know, with that amount of money, it's going to take about five days to get this transfer complete. The individual didn't appear to be very pleased by having to wait five days, but he thanked them and he walked away. A check of John's credit record shows this is not the first time someone has tried to steal the millionaire's identity. John Watson had a flag on his credit score because there had been two attempts to steal his identity at the end of 2009. Is that case somehow linked to the millionaire's murder? The following day, John Watson's apartment manager is confronted by a man with a scratched face who has a delivery for a dead man. When he gave it to the, to the manager, the manager told him and said, have you heard the news? Mr. Watson has passed away unexpectedly. I'm, I'm sorry. This fellow who was delivering the goods started crying and uh, turned and left. Inside the envelope, John Watson's wallet, his car keys, and a handwritten note. The note seemed very harmless. He said that he was returning his keys and his wallet, that he missed him at dinner, and that he hoped nothing was wrong. The man is caught on security camera. Police think John Watson's friends will know who he is. Photographs of that gentleman were shown to me on the Thursday evening by the police investigators who asked me if I could identify him, and I absolutely could not. The mystery man remains just that. Until the next morning, when detectives are searching John's apartment in the early hours, and the strange visitor returns. The elevator doors open, and out steps this individual wearing a dark sweatshirt, jeans, a baseball cap, and with scratches all over his face. Can I help you? No, it's OK. Startled. The man tries to leave, but is cornered before he can escape. They started searching him. He had a black backpack. They looked through the contents, finding a flashlight and a dust mask, plastic bags. And then, most incriminating of all, were the keys to Watson's apartment. Cops push for a name. When the man finally reveals his identity, John Watson's grieving relatives get the shock of their lives. The police officer said his name. John's sister did a double take. She sat up, she said, oh my God, we know that man. Two days after multimillionaire John Watson was found strangled, the Hoya police have a suspect in custody. Police officer said his name is Kent Keegwin. Keegwin is the high profile financial advisor from John's Swiss ski trips. What's he doing prowling around Watson's apartment in the early hours? Immediately, they handcuffed Keegwin, arrested him, took him to jail. They went and searched his apartment, and there on his living room table, was John Watson's bank statements. They also find the millionaire's missing laptop. San Diego fraud squad detective Fred Helm is called in to sift through Keegwin's computer records. Forensics on the cell phones and the computers. It's a very big step of any investigation, any fraud investigation, and, and, and specifically a, a murder investigation. You're always going to get the cell phone forensics of the, of the phones. He discovers Kent Keegwin was the one who tried to steal Watson's identity back in 2009. He had started stalking him electronically. Uh, he had opened an account 
with Watson's name, started a couple email addresses, and he was clearly setting up something with Watson as his target. Kent also has an intriguing online shopping list, lock picking tools, and a taser gun. Keegan used the name of a friend to order a taser online. Uh, he paid for it with his own credit card. The electronic trail of clues doesn't stop there. Keegan's cell phone shows strange number patterns that look like GPS coordinates. Very similar to the kind of messaging when we are tracking somebody's cell phone or when we have a GPS tracker installed on a car. Seems Kent's been running his own surveillance. He's been monitoring Watson's every move. There is a tracker on a vehicle, and it's on John Watson's vehicle. Investigators discover Kent Keegan was no friend of John Watson. He was a desperate wannabe. He had been in and out of a number of companies in the late uh, 2000s and had been fired for uh, trying to get too close to some of these uh, wealthy people he wanted on his client list. According to journalist Thomas Larson, Kent tried to insinuate himself into John Watson's rolled gold world. I thought of him as an international stalker, taking his daughter, as a matter of fact, to Switzerland, telling her that he'd been invited by his multi-billionaire friend, John Watson, for this skiing holiday. But his relentless attempts to win over the millionaire are futile. During the ski holiday, Keegan is rude and uncouth. Watson and his refined relatives are not impressed. And John refuses to take part in Keegan's financial schemes. John became upset based on that trip and, and just realized that this person was not who he, who he said he was. He wasn't a well-to-do financial advisor. He wasn't a skier. He wasn't, he wasn't a lot of things, apparently, that he was saying he was. And that sort of ended whatever friendship or acquaintance there was. Kent can't talk his way into this world of wealth. So he decides to cheat his way in, trying to steal John Watson's identity so he could live out his dreams of grandeur. Kent's internet searches became extreme, like how to buy a plane how to buy a yacht, websites where the rich and famous go to buy extravagant things. He started to fantasize about, I'm probably going to get this money, and here's how I'm going to live. When the online plan fails, Kent realizes the best way to steal another man's identity is to eliminate the real John Watson. Mr. Keegan recognized the opportunity to get a ton of money out of John's account, and all he needed to do was to get John out of the way. In November 2011, nearly 18 months after John Watson's murder, Kent Keegan stands trial, charged with murder, identity theft, forgery, and attempted grand theft. Prosecutors say that on June 6, 2010, Keegan broke into John Watson's apartment and lay in wait. A tracking device hidden on Watson's car, alerting him to the arrival of his prey. John was a person who was here alone. He was vulnerable in that sense. Nobody was going to miss him right off the bat because there wasn't somebody waiting for him at home or somebody who was going to come home and catch Kegwin in the act. John Watson is strong and fit. He won't be easy to overpower. But Kent has come prepared. He blasts him with 50,000 volts. It's kind of like an electric shock and, and, a, and a jackhammer at the same time. It's a charge that lasts about 30 seconds. John was immobilized from the taser shot. 
but he came to and he fought back. John scratches and claws at Kent's face, trying to break the grip on his neck. John fought for his life. But his attacker has the upper hand and enough strength for the final chilling act. So he's fought, we know by the scrapes and by the scratches, and he still, can't still has the grip on the neck until he completely wipes the life out of him. He had a purpose in mind when he went there, and his purpose was to kill John and to get his money. Keegwin takes John's wallet, using his driver's license to first transfer the money to an alternative broker, then initiate the multi-million dollar withdrawal. And he acted so quickly. He killed him on Sunday night, and Monday morning, he'd already gotten the transfer in progress online. It was already, already on its way. Everything done on that Monday. He was a busy guy. Thank you. Is there anything else I can help you with? No, that's all fine. Nice. Thank you. Hello, sir. Can I help you? Oh, yes. This is from Mr. Watson. Prosecutors believe Keegwin returned Watson's belongings the next day to see if the millionaire's death was being treated as a murder. Mr. Watson has passed away unexpectedly. I'm, I'm sorry. He went back to the apartment because he thought he was in the clear. Keegwin had a classic combination of grandiosity. He thought he could live this lifestyle by stealing someone's identity. He was greedy. He wanted the money without having to work for it. And he was also stupid. He made mistakes. Can I help you, sir? Oh, no, I, I, I must have the wrong floor. Just wait just a second. No, it's OK. Why go back? Expose yourself. But he exposed himself and walked straight into the hands of the police officers investigating this case. Yeah. At the end of an eight-day trial, the jury finds Kent Keegwin guilty on all counts. He is sentenced to life in prison with no hope of parole. It's fortunate that they did the autopsy and that his friends cared enough to push and say, you need to look into this because there's something wrong. And if, if it hadn't been for that, then he would have gotten away with it. Kent Keegwin almost got away with murder, but was brought to justice by John Watson's real friends. My uneasiness on that Tuesday evening led to solving a murder, saving John's family upwards of $10 million, and putting away a murderer for life. Some people are never satisfied. Instead of relishing the abundant riches in their own lives, they crave the lives of others. Barbara Ann Roberts enjoyed great wealth, but she killed the woman she thought had it all. While unquenchable greed drove Kent Keegwin to murder a generous, affable millionaire, they imagined the grass was greener on the other side of the wrought iron gates and saw no option but to covet and kill. Till next we meet, behind mansion walls, I'm Christopher Mason.